Hi everyone, welcome to the Mummy Movie Podcast, where we are examining the Mummy Resurrection from 2022. First things first, I would like to thank one of my $5 a month Patreon backers, Andrea. I really appreciate the support and I hope you enjoy all of the extra content. I should probably just say as well, uh, there were actually rumours of another film called The uh, The Mummy Resurrection. Apparently, depending on who you ask, it was either going to star Dwayne Johnson or Keanu Reeves. Not only is this not that film, unfortunately, but, well, that particular film is almost certainly just a rumour. The trailer was actually, you know, the trailer made for it was actually fan-made. Bit of a shame, to be honest, because, well, that sounded like a lot of fun. I don't often associate Keanu Reeves with mummy movies, but it would have been interesting to see how he would have, uh, you know, uh, coped with the genre. I'm sure he, he, I'm sure he would have done a great job, in all honesty. Um, in terms of the uh, the format for the episode, we shall start by taking a look at the historical aspect of the film, and then I shall simply review it and rate it out of ten. So we're talking about the uh, the normal format here. But before that, well, I'm sure you all know the drill by now. It is time for the dramatic intro. Right, it is the early 1900s and you are a man very much in debt. As such, you have borrowed money from a loan shark. Now, he wants you to repay him and will kill you in brutal fashion if you refuse. Fortunately, a rich treasure hunting relative of yours is on death's door. Unfortunately, he leaves all of his treasure to the British Museum, except for one cursed ancient Egyptian coffin, which he wants to be sealed away for eternity. You do a little research, and you find out that this coffin is not cursed at all. Instead, it is coated in a strange hallucinogenic oil, which makes anyone who touches it have nightmares so terrifying that they die of fright. Past this danger, sealed in the coffin, is a great prize. A mummy so perfectly preserved that she can be brought back to life. You decide there is a way of profiting from this. Working with your scientific cousin, you try to start the mummy's heart again. In doing so, you will be able to sell it as a spectacle. However, Little do you realise that the mummy is not benign. In their time, they were a brutal murderer, and as such, they were buried alive. Soon, you will have to face the mummy resurrection. Okay, so we've now arrived at the historical aspect of the film. So, I'm not going to go into every little detail here. Well, as ultimately, I, I've covered a lot of this in countless episodes before. Well, I say countless. I've done about 102 episodes, so I guess not countless, but the point is, I would be repeating myself a lot. Instead, I'm going to simply focus on one or two areas, going into a little bit more uh, detail, if you will. I, I think that would be better. The mummy here is called Kenneth Patar and is said to be a princess of the Second Dynasty. I'm not actually sure of anyone from the Second Dynasty called this, but there was a queen from the First Dynasty called Kenneth Happy, so I'm going to sort of focus a little bit more on her. She was uh, likely uh, one of the queens of the second ever full ruler of Egypt, Hor'aha, and was also the mother of a man named Jair, who would be the, the third ruler of Egypt. So. In this section, what I'm essentially going to do, I want to use um, this to paint a picture of what the very beginning of the First Dynasty, the world that uh, she would have been living in, essentially. And, well, as we do, of course, I shall point out a few inaccuracies, and, well, who knows, maybe I'll even, you know, spot a few accuracies in the film as well. Stranger things have happened. Admittedly, not many, but some. <laughs> Um, to understand this time period, we need to realise that before Egypt was unified, it was actually split into two lands. You had Upper Egypt in the south, and Lower Egypt in the north. 
I'm just going to refer to these as uh, southern and northern Egypt, just really for the uh, the sake of uh, simplicity. But just to let you know, their proper names are Upper and Lower Egypt. From about 3500 BC-ish, very roughly of course, in northern Egypt the rulers used to, um, they used to wear a red crown named the Deshret crown. Meanwhile in the south the rulers tended to wear the white Hejed crown and um, you've probably seen these before but the white one essentially looks a bit like um, a bowling pin. And then in around about 3100-ish BC, very approximately of course, a man named Nama seems to have uh, conquered both lands and unified them together. Then, as seen in the Nama palettes, uh, probably one of the most important artifacts of the time period, I mean arguably the most important depending on who you ask, we basically see Nama wearing both the red and white crown of well, northern and southern Egypt, indicating that he unified them together. Basically he's the first person in history he showed wearing both crowns. And actually from this point on, um, the, the pharaoh would often be seen wearing both crowns and it was actually called, um, you know, and was, was called the, the ruler of Upper and Lower Egypt. So the idea of these two lands didn't necessarily go away, they were just kind of unified together. Now, obviously it is fair to say that this um, view of Nama is oversimplistic in many ways. Um, and it's actually likely that the beginnings of this unification can also be seen in Nama's predecessors, uh, such as Ka and King Scorpion II. And, well, if you were wondering, uh, yes, King Scorpion II is the character that Dwayne Johnson played in The Mummy Returns, you know, the uh, best CGI'd character ever, and also obviously in the, the Scorpion King film, by which you mean the, the first one. There's actually five Scorpion King films uh, that have different people playing Scorpion King. I've reviewed them all on the channel and honestly, like, they're fascinating. Like, they're, they're, they are quite entertaining, but they're definitely in that kind of so bad it's good kind of vein. <laughs> I mean, think the episodes for them actually came out very well though. But essentially, going back to the point, either way, Nama is considered to have been the first man to truly unify Egypt bringing about the First Dynasty. And in fact, like, not only did Nama unify the land, but there's also evidence for him outside of Egypt as well, you know, even as far away as Canaan, so uh, kind of like where Palestine is today. So even at this early stage, not only do we have a unified country, we have trade with other civilizations, and well, on top of that, incredibly, hieroglyphs had already been around for at least a hundred years and were well, essentially fully developed by this point. Um, I think it's very easy to look back at these early civilizations and assume they must have been, you know, pretty simplistic. But ultimately, it does need to be remembered that Pharaonic Egypt was not the first phase of Egypt's existence. Humans had been in Egypt for thousands of years by that point. The earliest evidence for them actually dates back to 6000 BC. And, well, essentially it's not hard to see how that's plenty of time for some pretty complex ideas to develop. And on top of that, it needs to be realised that uh, even the people arriving in the Nile Valley in 6000 BC, you know, they would have had their own cultures and own identity. They wouldn't have just sprung up out of nowhere. As such, by the time of Nama, you know, by the time he unified Egypt, not only were hieroglyphs well established, not only was there trade going on with other groups outside of Egypt, but well, amazingly, already we had many aspects of Egyptian religion as well. Then, uh, during the First Dynasty itself, we get evidence for Wep Wawet. Um, he first appears during the reign of Den. Um, further to that, the cult of the Apis Bull, a god who would last throughout Egyptian history, dying off in around about 400 AD, first appears. Uh, just to give a bit of perspective to that, that means the Apis Bull lasts for about 400 years longer than uh, Pharaonic Egypt does, which is kind of insane if you think about it. Pharaonic Egypt was 3,000 years long, bear in mind. But essentially, the point I'm making is that once Nama had unified Egypt, it wasn't as if it was a completely fresh start. There was already rich culture in the land. This was not... That's not saying that uh, this wasn't a time of huge development, of course, but it is, uh, it's just important to realise. However, one thing that does seem to have come about, at least in part due to the unification of the land, was also the idea of a unified priesthood. 
Before Egypt was unified, different regions seemed to have had their own ways of worshipping the gods. Often this was through the use of like wise men and things like that. However, Nama, and indeed every king of the unified land that followed him, was technically viewed as the chief priest of all of Egypt. Technically speaking, in order to maintain cosmic order, uh, otherwise known as Ma'at, which was um, arguably the most important concept in all of ancient Egypt, the king would have had to perform um, like rituals at all of the various temples to all of the gods in Egypt. In reality, however, this wasn't really possible. After all, Egypt's a very big place. As such, a more standardised priesthood came about in Egypt, who would undertake these rituals and care for the uh, various statues of the gods in the, um, the sanctuaries of the temples as well. So, although the land was already very complex, this didn't mean that um, the unification of Egypt didn't also lead to a large amount of change as well. These things aren't mutually exclusive, they can happen alongside each other. After Nama, the throne was passed to his likely son, Hor'aha, who we've um, briefly mentioned earlier. During his reign, there's actually no evidence for, Egypt, um, for Egyptian activity outside of the, the Nile Valley. As such, it's likely that Egypt became more inward-looking, relying on its own resources. And, you know, it is worth noting that um, this isn't necessarily like a sign of um, decline or anything like that. We need to bear in mind, we are, Egypt had moved into a new sort of phase of its existence. There was a new type of rule, essentially. And so it may just be they were still figuring that out and they just realised that they were able to survive off of their own resources now, you know, now that the two lands were kind of merged into one. And in fact, one of the most impressive monuments dates to the reign of Hotaha. This is the tomb of his probable mother and the consort of, uh, of Nama, Nithotep. Uh, this tomb was built at Nakada, one of the most important and powerful places and cultures that had existed from about 4000 BC. You know, the Nakada culture was um, probably the most important culture of the, the pre-dynastic period. So the, the period just before um, Egypt was unified. Further to this, uh, during his reign, we see the first Mustaba tomb in North Saqqara. To explain this, um, basically a Mastaba tomb is an underground tomb with a large mud brick superstructure over the top of it. Interestingly, about 400 years later, Mastaba tombs would eventually evolve into the, uh, the pyramid tombs that are so iconically linked with ancient Egypt. As for Saqqara, well, this is the location of many later pyramids, including the Great Pyramid of Giza. So essentially it's a very important site it's probably the main way, even today, that Egypt gets its, um, its like, tourism. So in many ways, whilst Nama was a warrior king who unified the land and continued to trade in areas outside of the country, Hor'aha, okay, yes, he was more inward-looking, but also created some of the most important monuments of the First Dynasty. The next and last king we shall look at is called Jir. Now, according to an artefact known as the Palermo Stone, this is basically a king's list, which gives the orders of the kings of the 1st to 5th dynasty, along with some notes on significant events during the, you know, each of their reigns. According to this stone, the mother of Jair, and likely one of the consorts of Hor'aha, was Kenetapi, so the, the very woman we were looking at at the beginning of this historical section of the episode. During Jir's reign, although we do not see any sort of like first-hand evidence for activity outside of Egypt, the Palermo Stone does mention an expedition to Asia, though unfortunately it's not really any more kind of um, specific than that. Some Egyptologists as such argue that this expedition would have been um, just, you know, to the Sinai, while others argue that, um, he, you know, he would have gone as far away as um, southern Palestine today. I will admit, for myself, although I agree we can't really entirely know, I tend to lean more towards the latter of these options, um, largely because um, in his tomb at um, al Kabata Baidos, there were at, le at least a dozen Syrio-Palestinian vessels discovered. But like I say, we can't really know for certain. So anyway, going back to the kind of like original point of uh, this part of the episode, this is an Egypt that Kenneth Happy would have found herself in. 
In Egypt, that already had many of the gods that would be worshipped for many thousands of years to come. An Egypt that already had impressive monuments and relationships with foreign lands. But by the same token, although Egypt was already very rich in culture by this point, she would have still found herself in a time of great change. For instance, Kenneth Happy would have also been living in an Egypt where the priesthood was beginning to develop into a more standardised form. Going back to the film briefly, however, they put a lot of emphasis in Kenneth Happy being embalmed. And it is also noticeable she was buried in an anthropoid coffin. Firstly, embalming was not a thing during the First or Second Dynasty, though by the same token, there were already attempts at preserving the body and avoiding uh, decomposition, even, you know, even this far back. It's just they weren't physically embalming the bodies, you know, they weren't removing the organs and so on. So, for instance, at first, largely during the pre-dynastic period, so just before Pharaonic Egypt, uh, this was achieved by wrapping the body in reed matting or animal skins. Then later, baskets or large pots were placed over the corpses. In fact, when it comes to King Ja, so uh, the man we were talking about a second ago, the, the son of Kenetapi, we potentially even have his bandaged arm. And again, this doesn't mean that he was embalmed, of course. It just means that by this time, they were wrapping the body in bandages in order to preserve it, or, you know, at least to attempt to. As for the, um, the coffin of the mummy in the film, as said earlier, it's um, anthropoid in shape, meaning it's kind of like human shaped. This type of coffin didn't actually exist yet. At this time instead, the deceased were typically buried in either simple basket or like wooden box coffins. Normally they were placed on their side, um, their body um, pointing towards the south, whilst they faced the west um, towards the setting sun. And what's really cool here is this actually gives some evidence that, even at this early stage in Pharaonic Egypt, that the West was associated with the land of the dead, you know, with the, the sun going down into the, the land below. I think that's really cool, to be honest, that even that concept is it's that old. So, as you can see, the land that Kenetapi found himself in was, in many ways, highly developed. Writing had already been around for at least a hundred years. Egypt had recently been formed into one land. The priesthood associated with various cults were forming. Many of the well-known Egyptian gods were already being worshipped, and there was even evidence for some very complex Egyptian concepts, you know, such as Ma'at, the idea of cosmic order, and the West being associated with the land of the dead. It's really easy to look back on a civilization 5,000 years ago and assume that it must have been, you know, relatively simple and unevolved. But nothing could really be further from the truth. Humans had been in Egypt for 3,000 years by the time Pharaonic Egypt began. There was a rich history already present in the land. Kingdoms and cultures had risen and fallen. And so, although there is no denying that this was, um, you know, a time of great change, it is not really a good idea to view these um, early days of Pharaonic Egypt as, um, you know, the beginning. They were more simply a new chapter in an already very long and detailed book. Okay, so time for the review. My initial impressions of this film were actually pretty good. Everything is lit very nicely. The script may be a, you know, a little bit stiff, but it feels like um, effort has gone into it. The music is mostly fine, and it does feel like the film is trying to be a little bit different than other films in the same vein, which is always appreciated. Don't get me wrong, this is still blatantly a, a low-budget B-movie, and the acting is, you know, it's a little bit off, but it does feel like a certain level of care and attention went into this, and I can respect that. On top of that, I like the actual setting of the film. Rather than taking place in the modern day, it, it, it's, instead it's set in the 1900s, which does give the film a kind of like cool aesthetic, or at least I think it does personally anyway. Initially as well, um, the characters do have enough to differentiate them. 
even if a little more character development would have been appreciated. So, for instance, we have Sykes, um, the, the loan shark, who is, he's easily the, uh, the most evil man in the film. He has no redeeming qualities whatsoever and lives purely to line his own pockets with cash. Not only that, but he takes pleasure in murdering people who can't pay him back. So, you know, he's pretty despicable as, as a person. We then have Everett, the man who needs to pay Sykes back. He's not a particularly nice man either, but you do kind of get the feeling that this is partially because he's kind of backed into a corner. Next, we have the, uh, the sort of like main good guy, Archie. He's uh, well-intentioned, though easily manipulated by Everett, as essentially Everett manages to convince him into doing some incredibly dubious things, as we shall see a little later. Finally, we have the maid, Nancy, who's going out with Archie, and they're basically in a bit of a, a secret affair and engagement as well. The film does a, a fairly good job of showing how evil can be contagious as well. So, for instance, Sykes is evil and backs Everett into a corner, which leads to Everett corrupting Archie. It is then Nancy, who is a kind of like voice of reason, who manages to break the chain. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not certain if this, um, this message was, you know, actually intended. You know, I don't know if the film was actually trying to portray this. We are, after all, talking about a, a very cheap B-movie here. But it, it's kind of how I watched it, and I do think it's an interesting premise, nonetheless. In fact, even with the admittedly minor amount of character background information, this theme can actually still be seen. For instance, um... We find out that Everett's father was a gambler who lost all of his money. And, um, well, why do you think that Everett is in debt himself? Gambling. Just one more example of sort of like bad traits being contagious. All of this means that, as well as, you know, initially enjoying the film, there were even some threads that ran throughout it which were very interesting. And it's not often you can say that about B-movies. I, I don't think so anyway. Normally, when you're looking at B-movies, you're kind of wanting them to fall into the, the so bad they're, they're good at Adam Sol area. And I actually do appreciate this for the reason that I think it was made. There are also kind of like other elements in this film, which I will admit they weren't necessarily for me. I didn't particularly like them, um, but I can understand why they put them in and I do think they were interesting nonetheless. So, uh, to start with, um, there's a curse on the coffin of the mummy, which says that anyone who touches it will die of fear. Later, it is revealed that there's like this hallucinogenic oil that coats the coffin, and this leads to anyone who touches it having like nightmares that scare them to death. I can appreciate this approach as it, you know, it's a little bit different, though I will admit I am a fan more of the kind of like simple supernatural curse. That's just more what I kind of prefer. Um, largely this is because I think when you start trying to explain these things of science, it's not hard for, you know, very, very big plot holes to suddenly, like, appear. For instance, uh, we see the dreams of people after they've touched the oil on the coffin. They all dream of the same mummy, and, you know, there's no real explanation as to why. After all, the, the mummy is sealed in the coffin. None, in, none of these people have seen the mummy. I can also appreciate that in this one they try to use kind of like Frankenstein-esque science to raise the mummy from the dead. Rather than using lightning as we see in Frankenstein, however, they need to give the mummy a, a blood transfusion and an, an insulin shot. The problem here though is that pretty much everyone knows you can't just put old blood in, in a body and expect it to work. That's just not how things work. In fact, to a degree this reminded me a bit of um, Termina um, Terminator Salvation for anyone who's seen that film where one character just, you know, decides to give his heart to someone else, um, you know, for a heart transplant, and you're just sat there going, I'm sorry, what? Like, I, I'm sorry, I know that's set in the future, but that's not how things work. <laughs> and, you know, don't get me wrong, films don't have to be 100% accurate, far from it, but I, I do feel like you have, you know, you should um, at least treat your audience with a certain level of, like, intelligence, you know, don't treat them like idiots anyone would be able to see that this is not how it works and for me at least that does detract a little bit from what you know from from the film in you know so like it's again it's, it's another reason why i i would prefer it if they just um went the supernatural element and found another way of trying to be a bit more unique
But, you know, like I say, I, I can at least appreciate um, what the film has tried to do here. I appreciate that they are trying to be a little bit different. It just wasn't really for me personally. However, like on, on the downside, the film also seems to spend a lot of time reiterating things that have already been said. We are told multiple times that Archie has successfully restarted a rat's heart. We are reminded multiple times that the coffin is cursed. And then when they find out that the oil coats it and causes hallucinations, well, we're reminded of that multiple times as well. And, you know, I can understand why the writers have done this, as well, ultimately, you do want, you know, plot points in films to be easy to follow. But I also feel they, they overdid this, and it, it's kind of better to just, you know, show the curse happening. You don't really need to then explain exactly what the audience has already seen. It's kind of weird in that regard, actually, because very often when you're looking at films, you have the concept of showing, not telling, and, and that's a good concept. It feels like this film shows you and then tells you about it and then tells you again, and it's just like, it's pointless, really. Moving on, when it comes to Archie, although I can appreciate that he's, you know, supposed to be being manipulated by Everett, his cousin, who's, um, you know, the one who's in debt to the loan shark, I also feel he's a bit too much of an idiot. For instance, when Archie feels that um, Everett has gone too far and no longer wants to help him, Everett threatens to let the uh, the papers know about his and uh, Nancy's affair. As such, Archie continues to go along with him, which literally leads to him killing a woman. You know, he does a despicable act there. The issue here, though, is that, well, earlier on in the film, it's established that he and Nancy were always intending to run away together because they were they, they knew that the news was inevitably going to get out anyway. So it's a pretty flimsy piece of blackmail to not only kill a woman with, but to also raise an evil mummy from the dead. <laughs> the mummy in this film, Kanet Batar, is also, to be honest with you, I just think incredibly underwhelming. I should stress, this is nothing to do with the actress who plays her or the makeup team. They, they both do, you know, a fine, a fine job. However, the problem here is she comes to life for less than a minute in this film. She literally comes to life, rips out Everett's heart, and then gets shot in the head. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but when you've been building to that moment for the entire film, that's just not good enough. It's incredibly underwhelming. I, you know, in fairness, I did enjoy that scene, but I, I needed more. And not like a... I need more, but I've been denied it, and so I'm thinking about it. It's more just the case of that was rubbish because I needed more. The final negative I want to talk about here... Um, okay, so there's no denying this film feels a lot longer than its 85 minutes. Honestly, there's no one reason for this. It's just a lot of little negatives adding up, and it, it did lead to me breathing a, a bit of a sigh of relief when the film came to an end. I hate to say it, but that is true. Therefore... Overall, it's fair to say that this is not the, the worst film I've ever seen. I enjoyed the aesthetic, the, the lighting, the music for the most part. Uh, I like the, the 1900 setting. On top of that, although I'm not sure it was entirely intentional, there was even a decent theme that showed how evil is contagious. Further, although it was not for me, I can appreciate that they, um, you know, at least tried something different with the mummy, you know, focusing on, on science rather than um, supernatural curses and things like that. However, on the downside, the script and acting were both, you know, just a little bit off. Archie was far too gullible. The mummy only comes to life for about 30 seconds, which I'm sorry is just ridiculous. And a lot of little negatives lead to the film feeling a lot longer than it actually was. And, you know, I am going to be a little bit kind to this film. A lot of B-movies fall into the kind of like, so bad it's good category. Uh, you know, where they're, they're entertaining for reasons that, that weren't really intended. But by the same token, at least those films are entertaining. And I just don't feel that this one entirely was. Overall, this film... It was trying to do something, it achieved it to a degree, but it was still just in quite boring and there was just one too many little negatives. Overall, I am giving this film a 5 out of 10.
Thank you very much for listening. I certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have, why not, you know, like, subscribe, leave a comment, follow the Mummy Movie Podcast on Instagram and Facebook, subscribe to my Patreon. If you're going to a, you know, like a bake sale, why not make cookies in the shape of uh, the Mummy Movie Podcast logo? If you know Brendan Fraser, why not tell him about this podcast and urge him to listen? You have no idea how much I would appreciate that, actually. And if you are Brendan Fraser, if you are, you know, just happen to be listening right now, hi, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a really big fan. Um, I doubt he's listening, but you know, you never know, I guess. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all very much for listening, and please join me next time where we shall be looking at The Curse of the Aztec Mummy from 1957. A film that pits a luchador mask wearing superhero against gangsters and, well, also, of course, um, an Aztec mummy. <laughs> I find there's two groups of people who um, see sentences like that. One group go, that sounds terrible, why would anyone watch that? And the other group go, that sounds terrible, I must watch it. Uh, you know, respect to both groups, of course, but I'm definitely in that second group. Um, anyway, I hope you all have a fantastic next two weeks, and see you then.